Hi again. Okay, welcome back to the second half of our lecture on Southeast Asia. Um, hopefully you watched the first one before watching this one. All right, let me share the screen. And there we go. Okay, so we left off talking about Southeast Asia. And um, I said we would come back to that bar is in the way. It says economic growth in the post-Vietnam War. Okay, so I've explained that this area is a shatter belt, meaning the reflection on my glasses is super annoying. So I'm gonna take those off. <clears throat> I explained that Southeast Asia is a shatter belt, which means that it has um, very good access to trade and very good access to land, larger populations. So as a result, people have wanted to control it for a very long time. Southeast Asia also has a lot of resources. It's in the tropics. So it's going to have the kinds of resources you would, if you remember back to when we talked about Africa, Central Africa and the Congo and how there's a whole diversity of resources that you would find in the um, Congo uh, rainforest. Same thing in the Amazon rainforest. And when you are in the mid latitudes, you can't get the same things that you would get in the low latitudes. So you have a similar issue in Southeast Asia. I'm not saying that they're all the same resources, but they're all at the same latitude. So in the same way that the central part of Africa was colonized in the same way that South America was colonized, uh, Southeast Asia was wanted because it was a shatter belt and because it has a whole lot of resources. And remember, this is where rice grows very well as well. So um, there's a lot happening in Southeast Asia, and that's one of the many reasons that people have tried to control it for a long time. Now, when we talk about Japan next week, I'm gonna discuss how Imperial Japan took over China all the way down into Southeast Asia, took over the South Pacific, eventually got to Hawaii and bombed Pearl Harbor. And one of the main reasons that Imperial Japan did that is because they were trying to grow their empire. And in order to grow their empire, they needed more resources. They took over places that were pretty resource rich. And so we'll come back to that next week when we talk about Japan and how Japan affected Southeast Asia. <clears throat> but just be aware that the Vietnam War that we're aware of, right? The Vietnam War, the conflict um, between the US and the Viet Cong was one in a long list of conflicts, imperial takeovers, colonization for, a very, very long period of time, you know, for over a thousand years. So what happens during the Vietnam War, I'll come right back to this, uh, never mind. What happens during the Vietnam War, actually, let me open up my map again. Okay, so what happens during the Vietnam War, see Japan eventually takes over this part of the world, but before Japan took it over, France had been controlling it. Before that, the Siam Kingdom had been controlling it. There had been many different people who had tried to control Southeast Asia for a long time. And so let's just take the Vietnam conflict as an example, because when we talk about, when we talk about the economy of this region today, it, it's important to understand all the things that have affected it over time, but the most recent things that have affected it make sense with the economy of today and the environmental destruction and a lot of the issues that we see with labor in this region today. Okay, so <clears throat> if you know anything about the Vietnam War, you probably know it was a conflict. You probably know that there was a whole lot of Americans who fought in it, who died in it. Um, maybe you know that 2 million people left Southeast Asia afterwards. They were called the boat people. That's not my name for them. Uh, and the boat people escaped not just Vietnam, but Cambodia, Laos, uh, because you had this vacuum of power and you had these, in some places, very violent regimes that took over. And um, people were escaping and they were escaping out. Basically, they would escape on boats. They would hide in fishing boats and they would go from Vietnam or Cambodia and make their way to Malaysia or Indonesia where there were, where there were refugee camps. And then from there, they would go to France. A lot of people went to France because uh, Vietnam had been a French colony before the Vietnam War. So a lot of people spoke French. A lot of people went to the US because, again, because of the Vietnam War. And a lot of the reason that people were leaving Vietnam was because of the Vietnam conflict. So <clears throat> you might know that about Vietnam. You might know 
that the Vietnam conflict had a lot to do with the Cold War. And so we remember we talked about the Cold War when we talked about Russia and how the Cold War was very much a battle for resources. So everything that I've been saying about how Southeast Asia is rich in resources would then make sense that, and if you remember me saying this in class, that the places where the Cold War got hot, I know that's a very cheesy thing to say, but the places where the Cold War got hot was former colonies. And former colonies were where the USSR and the US were battling out the, their demand for resources and trying to win with the strongest economy. And the strongest economy was going to be the one who controlled the most resources around the world and was also efficient and all that other stuff. So <clears throat> this became a battleground during the Cold War because it had been controlled by Imperial Japan. Uh, before that, it had been colonized by the French. The French tried to recolonize when Imperial Japan was pushed back into Japan after World War II. And then China and Russia were like, no, we would like some of that as well. So then there becomes this whole battle. And part of that battle also had to do with Ho Chi Minh. If you've ever heard of Ho Chi Minh or Ho Chi Minh City, he was a person who had been wanting the, Viet, uh, the liberation of Vietnam for a very long time. In fact, he was at the Treaty of Versailles. That's the end of World War I. So that's 1919. In 1919, he was at the Treaty of Versailles asking the French to leave Vietnam. Um, so he had been attempting to have a free Vietnam for a long time. And then during the Cold War, there was this attempt to control the resources of Vietnam by the French once again. The French and the US were on the same side, so the US wasn't going to support Vietnam's independence. So who did Vietnam go to? Just like the story we saw in the Congo, just like we saw over and over again, uh, the Vietnamese went to China and the USSR. That was the other, remember, if you remember me telling the story about Lumumba, and Lumumba uh, leading the free state of the DR Congo and attempting to create an economy that was going to educate his people and support his people. And the US didn't um, support a lot of economic effort to grow that economy. And so who did he start to talk to? The USSR. And then it becomes a question of the Cold War. And that's how Lumumba was um, murdered by the CIA and then Mobutu was put into place. So very similar story happening in Vietnam, where you have a group of people who want to have an independent country after being colonized for a very long period of time. They try to get resources. Some people are like, no, we would like your resources, so we're not going to give you resources to be independent. And then they went to the other side. And now it becomes a question of the Cold War. So the Cold the Vietnam conflict was a 40 year long conflict and it started kind of slowly and it really, really escalated in the 1960s and the 1970s. And what happened during that time was there was um, a lot of, of different tactics that were used in this battle. This was a different type of war in that, you know, like old fashioned war, people kind of march into battle against each other. And you know that evolves with time, but the Vietnam War was very different because there was no battleground. There was no like front, you know, like there was the Eastern Front and there was the Western Front in World War I and World War II. There was no front. There was no place where the war was happening. It was this series of attacks that were, that if you've ever seen Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump, they're like kind of wandering the Vietnam, Vietnamese countryside until they run into a group of people, until they run into the Viet Cong, and that's where the battles happened, which is a very, very difficult way to win a war um, for many different reasons, which we don't need to go into military history right now. But so some of the tactics, because of that style of warfare, some of the tactics that were used were tactics that really destroyed the landscape during the war and then after. So one was the placing of, um, of uh, bombs, what are they called, landmines, all over Cambodia, all over Laos, all over Vietnam. So that was a way to kind of entrap the Viet, Viet Cong, but it wasn't just the Viet Cong who was walking in the countryside. It was farmers, it was children, you know, it was people on their way to work. And those weren't cleaned up. In fact, a lot of them still aren't cleaned up. A lot of the landmines that were planted during Vietnam uh, the Vietnam War actually still in place, if you can imagine. Another tactic that was used was Agent Orange, and you've probably heard about Agent Orange before, but Agent Orange was this chemical created by a company called Monsanto. If you've never heard of Monsanto, Monsanto today is famous for being 
really, really big in agriculture, but Monsanto started as this chemical company that essentially created this thing called Agent Orange. And Agent Orange was something that was sprayed all over the countryside. And what it did is <clears throat> it, um, what it did is it, is it disabled your ability to grow crops. One way, if you don't have like a, a front, if you don't have people, you don't have like a, a, you know, traditional kind of style of military where people are fighting here and, and the Viet Cong weren't really in control of the government. They weren't an official government. Usually when we look at war, you have an official government and an official government and one eventually gives up because they see the, you know, catastrophic, um, demolition of their industry, of their population, and they finally just say like, okay, that's enough. But there was no type of surrender because it was the Viet Cong and then there was the Vietnamese people kind of caught in the middle. And then there was American and Australian and French soldiers and all these other people there. So the spraying of the fields with Agent Orange was a way to kind of starve the Viet Cong out. It was so, okay, if I disable your ability to grow food, rice to support yourself well then eventually you're going to starve and you're going to end this conflict but again the lasting effect was that the soil didn't regenerate itself when the conflict ended it's not like the conflict ended and the soil was like you know got rid of agent orange and was able to grow things again so i bring up those two issues for a very specific reason. If we want to understand the economy of Southeast Asia today and why in so many ways it seems to compromise its people and its environment, you need to understand that part first. That part is crucial in knowing like where Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos and to a lesser degree Thailand were at the end of the conflict. You know, they, they like I said, the Vietnamese people were there and they had these Americans and they had these Viet Cong and Chinese fighting amongst themselves while people were still trying to farm and go to work and they weren't necessarily caught up in that conflict. So what happens when the conflict ends is again, they're, they're left, the Americans go home, the Viet Cong kind of go back into the South, the Chinese go home and they're left with this, with this wrecked countryside a countryside that has landmines in it, a countryside that has soil that's been completely um, debilitated by Monsanto. Sidebar, the reason that Monsanto got into agriculture is because they had all these leftover chemicals after the Vietnam War. And so they funneled those chemicals into synthetic fertilizers and synthetic herbicides and synthetic pesticides. So anyway, <clears throat> so, what happens is you have a people who emerge from this conflict after everybody who was fighting the conflict kind of leaves and now the people are left and they're like, what are we going to do? And we're going to come to, to China after this and we're going to see that China was in a pretty similar situation, not the exact same situation, but they were really desperate at the end of the 1970s as well. So this is mid 1970s. This is the end of the 1970s. And they took their economies in kind of similar directions, but China did something that was very, very important that has allowed them to grow to the second biggest economy in the world, whereas Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos are still very much developing economies. There's more differences, obviously, than, than what they, kind of the pivotal difference that I'm going to explain next week with China, the size um, of the country, you know, the availability of resources, all of that kind of stuff. But the, a really big difference is that, okay, so Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, to a lesser degree, Thailand, <clears throat> they were really at this economic nadir, just like this economic, this period in their economic history where they were just at the absolute bottom. They couldn't grow food all over their countryside, and they also had a vacuum of power. Remember, like I said, this is an area that had been controlled by imperial forces for a long time, whether it was Imperial Japan, whether it was uh, colonial France, whether and then going back and back and back. So when that conflict ended, there wasn't necessarily a government that was there to come back and say like, okay, we got this, we're gonna control our countryside again, we're going to get our economy going. So there was this battle for power 
a similar thing happened in Afghanistan in the last 20 years. You know, we talked about Southwest Asia and how similar things happened there. Similar things happened in Africa after the end of colonization. So you have this vacuum of power. And in some places like in Cambodia, this little country right here, the group that the military uh, group that comes to power, they were called the um, Khmer Rouge. The Khmer Rouge, when they come to power here in Cambodia, I mean, they just annihilate people. There was a period of time in Cambodia called the Killing Fields where genocide was committed on a good number of the Cambodian population. So you had governments like that who took over in this aftermath of this very destructive war. And then you had these very desperate economies. And so what those desperate economies developed was, where did my lecture go? Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. <clears throat> So you have to think about kind of people at the end of this conflict and taking stock of their resources. And so they just kind of opened their doors and said, all right, who is willing to do business with us? And in what way are you willing to do business with us? And the rest of the world was like, well, you have some really nice timber there. Why don't we start to uh, cut down your rainforests? And other people were like, um, hey, you know, your laborers will work for really cheap. And tariffs were, starting to be it used to be really difficult to manufacture clothing and stuff like that in other countries because there was a lot of tariffs between countries but in the end of the 1970s we were entering an era where tariffs were becoming something that was unpopular and seen as like anti-capitalist and not very good for business so you had a lot of manufacturing that started to move into places like vietnam and we're talking cheap manufacturing again next week we're going to talk about east asia and japan South Korea, Singapore, which is actually in Southeast Asia, um, Taiwan, they all grew their economies for manufacturing as well, but they grew their economies from high-end manufacturing. Whereas Southeast Asia, they took in low-end manufacturing, clothes, shoes, that, that they didn't get paid a whole lot to make. Uh, and the reason that manufacturers would have gone in to a place like Vietnam was their laborers were desperate. They were work, willing to work for very, very cheap. They didn't have the environmental standards. In the 1970s in the US, what was happening is the creation of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, that was essentially saying, okay, industry, you can't continue to like dump a whole bunch of crap into our rivers. You can't continue to put a whole bunch of you know uh, gases into our atmosphere. And all of that costs money with production. So companies were like, let's go over here. Laborers are desperate. We can just dump all our waste into the river, <clears throat> spew all kinds of shit into the atmosphere and uh, you know, then bring back the goods and sell them to a much higher consumer market in places like the US and Europe and Australia. So they take in really, really cheap labor and that really cheap, or sorry, they take in really cheap manufacturing and that really cheap manufacturing takes advantage of just dumping crap all over the countryside. And then sex tourism becomes a big part of the economy. So sex tourism is, I think I've talked about it in this class, but just in case we haven't talked about it. And I mentioned sex, tra I mentioned um, sex trafficking and brothels here in South Asia last week that South Asia has the highest number of prostitutes in the world. And um, it's one of the trafficking, like the highest, number of women are trafficked into sex work in South Asia. Um, but sex, sex um, tourism is where you have people who travel from one country and go to another country specifically to buy sex. And I know you think like that doesn't really happen. It absolutely happens. And it happens in, so just imagine what the stratification of that is going to look like. It happens in the wealthiest countries in the world. You have people who go from these countries into very, very poor countries and they buy sex for very cheap. And I always ask students, like, why do you think they do that? Because the three top countries in the world where sex tourists come from, so the three top countries in the world where sex tourists come from are Germany, the US, and Australia. And what's interesting about that is sex work is legal in Australia, sex work is legal in brothels in Germany, Sex work is legal in Las Vegas in the US. So why travel, if you're Australian, all the way to Thailand? I know it looks clo close, but it's like an eight hour flight. I flew from Melbourne to Thailand once and it was like an eight hour flight. So it's still you know, a good, good space you have to go over. 
why fly there for to buy something that you can buy in your own country? And a lot of times students will say, oh, because it's cheaper. Yeah, it's cheaper, but you also have to fly there. That, that kind of, um, you know, adds to your cost, your overhead for sure. And one of the biggest reasons is that it's not regulated. So I have a lot of students who think, because I talk about sex tourism in Southeast Asia, they think like, oh, sex work is legal there. Sex work is not legal there. Sex work is not legal in these countries. The reason that sex work happens there is because, like I said, the economy was very desperate. You had, you had entire tourist agencies, tourist bureaus that started to create these underground um, um, underground uh, tubes is the only word I can think of, but it's not tubes, underground um, networks of getting people from like, let's say Germany, who wanted to go to a place like Thailand, you had all of these like underground, if you imagine like dark web, before there was a dark web, ways to, to figure out your trip to Thailand for two weeks where you're going to basically just frequent brothels or maybe frequent one brothel over and over again. So it's very important to note that it is not legal in Southeast Asia to sell sex work. It is legal in most of Europe. It is legal in Australia. It's legal in New Zealand. Um, it's legal to have to sell vaginal sex in Japan, but not oral sex. And it's legal to sell oral sex in Turkey and not vaginal sex. What do you think about that? So it's legal to um, sell sex, but not buy it in Sweden. And it is legal to buy sex and not sell it in Norway. So also think about that. Why would they create rules like that? It's called the Scandinavian model, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to note that it is not legal to sell sex here. So why is it such a big part of the economy? It's a big part of the economy because the economy is desperate. So a lot of people look the other way when it comes to tourists coming in from places like Germany or Australia and spending a whole lot of money. That money is going into the economy. They probably target the sex workers and not the Johns, not the people who are coming in to buy sex. And, um, and the reason that it's such a booming economy is because when sex work is regulated, then everybody has to be 18. Everybody has to wear a condom. Everybody gets tested for STIs. Whereas when it's not regulated, that's when you don't have to wear a condom. You can have sex with a 10 year old boy. Um, <clears throat> basically anything that you want, it's not regulated. The sex worker is not protected. And so think about that part of human psychology. Um, <clears throat> And again, remember, in no way am I saying like, oh, it's, it's all okay because people were desperate. But remember that it's not people in different places, that people are the same everywhere. We're just, we're the same everywhere. We wanna take care of our children. We wanna live a good life. We want to you know, work, but not work too hard. But depending on the circumstances of your history, depending on the circumstances of your geography, of your economy, very different things might be considered normal. That doesn't mean that they're considered, that they're actually okay. But, um, but I often have students who are like, how can they let that happen to their kids? <clears throat> and I agree with you. But at the same time, the reason maybe we don't see it happen here so much is because uh, we are not in that same kind of desperate situation, if that makes sense to you. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is not so much that the people there are so bad, I'm saying people are kind of good and bad everywhere, and we are often affected by circumstance. And, and I'll stop there. Um, <clears throat> all right, and make sure you note that I said people are good and bad everywhere. Not like people are bad everywhere, people are good everywhere. There's good and there's bad people everywhere. So it's just some people are able to, because of different economies, because of different governments and things like that, we're able to kind of, kind of squash some of the worst behaviors of humanity in some parts of the world. And in other parts of the world, it, it seems to be a lot more free flowing. Okay, so sex work, big part of the post-war economy. Tropical timber, another big part of the post-war economy. And so this timber is uh, used for furniture. It's used for a lot of different things. And who lives in our 
um, tropical rainforest in Indonesia. There's many, many things that live in our tropical rainforest because tropical rainforest is a place that's going to be very uh, biodiverse, but it is the only place that orangutans live. So orangutans live in the tropical rainforest of Southeast Asia. So what is happening to orangutans right now is they're endangered. They're endangered because we're cutting down all of their timber and we're using this timber to, um, I'll come right back to this. We're using this timber to, so this is a map of um, illegal imports going into China and it's illegal timber, pulp and paper. And essentially you have these, I don't know if you can even see what this is, but you have the illegal timber, like look at the brown, it's coming out of Indonesia, it's coming out of Malaysia, it's coming out of here in Thailand, it's coming out of parts of Africa. It goes into China for manufacturing. China manufactures cheap furniture for companies like Ikea. And then that furniture gets packaged and sent to places like the US, sent to places like Australia, to Europe, makes sense. So a lot of tropical timber is being used in cheap manufacturing for cheap furniture and then being sent to places like the US. <clears throat> and then the other big reason that we have, um, that we are clearing out the tropical rainforest is for palm oil. So palm oil is an oil, it's a cooking oil, like canola oil or olive oil or something like that. It's used for cooking, it's used in food, cosmetics, um, it's used as machine oil. It can be fuel for cars. And what we do is we clear the forests and uh, drain swamps, and then we build these palm oil plantations. And so we're removing the biodiversity of the tropical rainforest, we're replacing it with these um, trees and then basically turning our tropical rainforest into a farm for palms and their oil. And a whole lot of carbon is released by this, if you can imagine. First, the clearing of the rainforest, right? So uh, trees and plants, what they do is they take in the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they breathe it in, right? They, they separate the oxygen and the carbon. The plant or the tree sequesters the carbon in the soil and also holds a lot of that carbon in its little tree body and then it expels the oxygen and then we breathe in that oxygen isn't that night nice isn't that nice how trees are just doing that for us every day for free so when we cut down those trees what we do is we often burn that timber or else we send it to china to be manufactured into um cheap furniture and then the carbon that has been sequestered in that tree is now released back into the atmosphere Plus, the way that we grow the palm oil releases a lot of the carbon that's sequestered in the soil back into the atmosphere. And carbon uh, dioxide is one of our greenhouse gases. It's one of those, like I said earlier in the last lecture about Southeast Asia, <clears throat> that it's a variable gas that sits in the atmosphere and acts like a sponge and just like kind of sponges up all the heat in the atmosphere. So, yeah. Um, consumer demand for tropical timber, so palm oil as well, but tropical timber is mostly in North America, Europe, and Japan, and that's our IKEA furniture basically. Um, and we have a lot of quantities, like I said, I showed you that map of timber that's sold to China, made into furniture, plywood, flooring, and then sold to the core. By the core, I mean the core countries of the world, the wealthiest countries, diverse economies of the world. So what happens to the atmosphere when there's fewer trees? Like I said, I just explained what happens to the atmosphere when there's fewer trees. Those trees that were sequestering the carbon and putting it in the soil and sequestering it and keeping it in their body, like the tree body, now it's released into the atmosphere <clears throat> and the palm trees do not replace, they do not replace the tropical rainforest when it comes to all of the things that the tropical rainforest is doing for our atmosphere, not to mention the wildlife that lives in, those, in that tropical rainforest. So when we look at deforestation, Southeast Asia is about 25% of deforestation globally. So that is really serious when we talk about the rainforests of the world, because like I said, the rainforests of the world run along that tropical belt. They're in Africa, they're in South America, and they're in Southeast Asia. And so if we are cutting down tropical timber there, what we're doing is we are deforesting 
25% of our deforestation globally is happening in Indonesia and Malaysia and in uh, Vietnam. And that is, so not only is that carbon being released that's in those trees and in that soil, but that's also removing this mechanism for removing carbon from the atmosphere because those trees in order to live what they do like i said is they breathe in carbon dioxide they separate the oxygen they expel the oxygen giving more oxygen to the atmosphere and then they sequester that carbon taking that carbon out of the atmosphere so what's happening when we are cutting down those trees is we're just taking away our ability to pull that carbon out of the uh, atmosphere and that's not good because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So some places in Southeast Asia, forests have decreased by 60%. Just imagine what that means for the, the atmosphere. So the reason that before I talked about all of this with the environment, I wanted to make sure that you understood why Vietnam and, and uh, Cambodia and Laos and places like that would, would make the choice to, and Indonesia, um, would make the choice to have an economy based on deforestation and sex tourism and cheap manufacturing. And, and remember that there was this point of desperation and that those economies basically grew out of those, that point of desperation. And remember that we all contribute to it with our IKEA furniture. When we use palm oil, we're all contributing to that economy as well. This should say growth pole at the top. I'll minimize that. You see growth triangle, not growth pole, sorry, growth triangle. So growth triangle is what is happening in Southeast Asia right now. So some good news. Now that is when, okay, let's say that I'm a country that's really rich in resources, but I don't have capital. Or let's say that I'm a country that's really rich in labor, but I don't have resources. Or let's say that I'm a country that's rich in capital and I don't have resources or labor. And so if you join your forces, if you have those three different elements in different countries and you join your forces, what you can have is what we call a growth triangle. So a significant growth triangle in Southeast Asia right now is Malaysia for resources. So Malaysia right in here. This is Malaysia, it's north of Indonesia. Um, Malaysia for resources, Vietnam for labor, and Singapore for capital. And what's happening is Singapore is financing the production of resources that then go into the growth of, of goods coming from Vietnam. And now this varies in what kind of, what kind of manufacturing is going to happen here. Um, but with a growth triangle, the idea of it isn't that you take in the same cheap manufacturing that keeps you, you know, uh, working 50 hours a week and making an average of 59 cents an hour, which is about what the average Nike worker is making around the globe. So Nike, for example, shoes, um, their average manufacturing laborer, so their average person that's putting their shoes together, or sewing their clothes is working about 50 hours a week and making about 59 cents an hour. So um, the idea with the growth triangle is to not take in that kind of manufacturing, take in high-end manufacturing, or maybe not high-end manufacturing when it comes to clothes, but taking in uh, manufacturing that pays more <clears throat> than a Nike or an Old Navy. Now with export-led growth, we still have the issue because this is export-led growth. It's basically pooling our resources and building something that's based on exporting a good to bring in capital. So what is export-led growth? It's what I just said. It's a strategy that directs the domestic economy towards producing uh, goods for core countries, for that high capital core country. And one of the issues with that is it can bring in capital to a place that doesn't have a lot of capital. The problem is, is that first of all, core countries wouldn't remove their manufacturing from their countries unless it, they were getting a deal, right? So you're still not gonna make very much as a manufacturer. And it also, the other big reason is that places like the US wouldn't remove their manufacturing if they weren't allowed to misuse the environment in different places. So this export-led growth that we're seeing bringing higher paying jobs and higher paying um, return for resources is also kind of based on this grow now, or yeah, build now, clean up later, clean up being the environment, basically. This is, uh, this is the same sort of export 
led growth that we've seen in Latin America and in Africa and um, has not necessarily been successful. <clears throat> and then I wanted to come to this idea of EPZs. We're going to talk about this again when we get to China, but an export processing zone. This is also something that we see in this region. It's, it's, a, it's a zone that allows for special economic rules. It's something that's supposed to facilitate export-led growth. It allows you, Long Beach, for example, here in California is an, is an export processing zone. That means that Long Beach, the port at Long Beach has a, some different rules when it comes to labor, when it comes to environmental standards, basically it has weaker rules. So when you look at an EPZ, it might have a different rules when it comes to, when it comes to something like um, environmental standards or labor standards. It also might have fewer tariffs, and this is something that we're going to get to next week in China. The, uh, the, the way that China is mostly closed, or for a long time was mostly closed, but they just opened these five cities as EPCs. There's incentives to foreign companies to try to attract foreign direct investment into EPCs. So this is something that Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia are all using this, these EPCs to facilitate their export-led growth, but it is having a lot of adverse effects on the environment. We're gonna see the same thing again in China next week. And like I said, labor, a little bit better than it has been, but not great. And this is something that, you know, I have this um, mostly fem female between 80 and 90% in new factories are women. And that's true for manufacturing clothing around the world. So if we actually looked at the percentage of women who work in clothing manufacturing around the world, it's 97% female. So 97% of the people who are manufacturing clothes around the world are female. And statistically, those women invest money directly back into their families. So statistically, that 97% of garment laborers, um, people who are working in fashion manufacturing around the world, take the money that they earn and invest it directly back into their children, buying their children nutritious foods, making sure that their nutrition goes, uh, their <laughs> their children go to school, trying to break that cycle of poverty. This is an important point to make, not because I'm trying to create like an issue between what mothers do versus what fathers do, but statistically, if we, if we know that we have this economy around the world that has to do with, um, you know, manufacturing clothing and fashion, we know that it's primarily women who are working in it. We know that those women statistically invest the money that they make, the majority of the money that they make back into their children. If we're concerned with growing the standard of living around the world, if we're concerned with the plight of children around the world, um, the plight of the labor around the world, the safety of the labor, the safety of the woman who in, in this area of the world, remember I said that, the, that a big part of the economy is sex work and sex trafficking. So if you're not working in a factory, and this is true, a lot of women from the rural countryside of Vietnam or Cambodia go to the cities to get jobs in manufacturing and a lot of them end up in sex work. And again, the reason that sex work is going to be a big part of the economy in that part of the world is because it's not regulated. So these are not empowered sex workers. These are not sex workers who are making their own rules and getting paid well. These are sex workers who are going to be very much abused by brothel owners. So if we look at all of that, that hopefully incentivizes us to invest more into the pers people who are making our clothes around the world. You know, one big argument I try to make is in all of my classes is that we want to pay attention to where our goods come from, whether it's our clothes, whether it's our food, because that laborer and the environment are all going to be affected by the choices that we make, the choices that, that uh, we make when we choose to consume something. And if we know that the garment industry is employing laborers who are going to most likely invest that money back into their children and that could break the cycle of poverty and that could change the livelihoods of so many people around the world that is something that we want to focus our energy on so there you go <clears throat> and um i'll leave us with a different quote of the day actually i don't want to leave us with that quote i want to leave us with this quote this is from a book that i read a while ago called the sins of our mothers it was about these 
19 women in apartheid South Africa, if you remember me talking about apartheid and apartheid, sorry, uh, in South Africa, um, I kind of set up the rules of this like perfected racism in this country of South Africa. And it was illegal for people of different races to have sex with each other. So not just to get married, but to have sex with each other. And you still have people who had sex with each other. <clears throat> and, but often the person who was persecuted were women. So this book that I read a while ago called The Sins of Our Mothers is about these 19 women in South Africa who were all, who all gave birth to half white, half black children, and they were all kept in prison and then put on trial together. And this is the very last line of that book from the sins of our mothers, all these things flow. So think about what that means and um, watch the TED talks that I have up and all the videos that I put up with this, these lectures. I'm gonna try to find a good video on the Khmer Rouge so you kind of get, get an idea of who those people were in Cambodia. And um, yeah, and we'll be back next week. I'll have a lecture on China and then I'll have a lecture on Japan and the Koreas. So there'll be two different lectures, hopefully about an hour each next week. Okay, bye. I know how to turn this off. Oh, just.